you know, the stock trading room has these um, TV screens in all the, the corners that play the news all day long. And after the tsunami, you're just seeing pictures of Phuket over and over and over again. And I just really got the urge to move there. I don't know why, because like, maybe it reminded me I always wanted to go to Thailand. Just living there long term as an expat, is it an expensive place to live? The trick you see a lot of people, I think, is, is they don't think about how to earn money internationally while living here. So you get a lot of scamsters, tricksters, the people that just come out here with no idea of how they're going to live out here, how they're going to survive. And and then they just try this hustle, that hustle, the next hustle. And Well, hello there, Internet. Pete here from Tyrish Times. What's the story? How are you doing? Happy New Year to you, 2023. I hope it's a good year for you. Wishing you health and prosperity in this new year. 2023 is going to be, uh, well, a life-changing year for me. Well, 2022 was life-changing and 2023 is going to be just as life-changing. But anyway, what's the story? What do we have in store for you today? Well, today we're going to talk to a Phuket expat named David who's been on the island for nearly 20 years. And we're going to get into all sorts of stuff. Life in Phuket, what's it like? Cost of living, scams. We're going to talk about David. David's previous jobs, super interesting. We're going to talk about his current job. I really enjoyed talking to David. He's a really interesting fella and the type of guy that you could just have a beer or a coffee with off camera and he'd just be the same, you know, just full of information. And I do love interviewing the uh, expats on Phuket because they always do seem to tell interesting stories. David did say that he's going to hook me up with some more people on Phuket. Hopefully we can make that happen. Fingers crossed. We get to share their stories on the channel because I would love that. I really would. But anyway, let's go meet David and uh, hear his story. And don't forget, if you do like this, as I always say, hit the like button and uh, leave me a comment and uh, share the video if you can. Cheers. Let's do it, David. Okay. So um, in order to know about your life in Thailand and you know what you're doing now, I think we need to go all the way back to the very beginning. So... Tell me where you're from and what will, what was life like growing up for you? Okay, so I'm from Syracuse, New York, which is closer to Canada than New York City, uh, which is, I guess, when I moved there when I was three. And I basically grew up next door to a Thai family. So that's kind of very early on where I got connected with Thailand. The girls were like, one was uh, my older brother's age, one was my age, and there was a younger one. The families, we'd get together for Christmas and holidays. I grew up eating Thai food at their house. So like they were telling me stories of Thailand from the time I was a little kid and I'd go to their house and I'd see all the pictures on the wall and all the cool Thai artwork and stuff. So I've kind of always, you know, had this idea of someday I want to go visit the place they're from. Uh, and, you know, very different. Obviously, we'd get like three, four feet of snow in a night. And we'd get these crazy winter blizzards, really cold, miserable. People weren't very, I don't think, very happy. Uh, you know, we got two, three months of nice weather a year. Uh for me, I just, I've always liked the heat, the sun, and definitely where I came from, we didn't get any of it. I was actually there years ago in, in Syracuse. I passed through it on the way up to Toronto from, I think, New York. Right, okay, yeah. Yeah. Um, I went up through summertime. It was nice in the summertime, but I, I've heard, I've got a couple of friends in, in that area of America, and they always just complain about how cold it is. But anyway, um, so... Like growing up as a as a teenager into your say early twenties, like uh, were, what were you doing then at that period of your life? So I I went to school and I was I was a kind of a skater punk kid, and in my in Syracuse we actually had like a, a big vegan straight edge scene. I got into punk rock bands, uh, so I, I I I thought I wanted to be a musician when I was a kid. So I I did start traveling, playing in little bars and stuff all up and down the East Coast and maybe in the Midwest a little bit. And that was, you know, along with going on a lot of holidays with my parents, that's kind of, I got the travel bug a little bit. Uh, basically, I think it also helped me stay in school because I didn't really kind of get into drugs and all that stuff. Everyone else was messing around with it in high school. And just by the fact that I was in this straight edge band, you know, if, if you messed up, you got kicked out. So I think it, it helped me kind of get through school and out the other end, whereas in my hometown, you know, a lot of the kids I grew up with just kind of went to prison or went nowhere or, you know, got really messed up and things that I was able to avoid because I was into the skating scene. So how did you become a, a stock trader then? Because that sounds very different kind of a lifestyle to a, a stock trader. Well, it, it, that was kind of what came later on. So I, I basically eventually, I always kind of had pretty good discipline and not doing anything too crazy, even though I was always kind of surrounded by craziness. You know, I think that's something that's a skill that pays off in a place like Thailand as well. 
So when I'd be on the road and you'd see kids getting into this really bad stuff, you know, the kids would be doing heroin and all the sticking needles in their arm. I kind of always instinctively knew that this is not right. You just don't cross certain lines. And after a while, I realized that this was kind of most of the people that were living that lifestyle were going in a bad direction. So I basically went back home. I studied really hard, got straight A's. Uh, and the only reason I chose finance as a major and started studying really seriously was because back then they didn't call, they didn't have the word digital nomad or, or even the word remote. I think they used to call it telecommuting. And I remember going into the guidance counselor's office in, in university and thinking like, I need to choose a major. And th the whole idea that you could do a job from the computer and anywhere in the world, there was only like three or four jobs listed back then. And it was like computer program or stock trader. So I was like, well, I've always been really good at math. So I said like, let's, let's start taking extra statistics courses. Let's start doing projects uh, to try and learn how to predict the stock market. And then that kind of just took on a whole world of its own and eventually ended up as a stock trader. And where did you work as a stock trader? Uh, well, first I started doing it, it, it on my own account in university. And it, it, back then it really felt like I was playing a video game. It was really fun and exciting. Uh, then I, I, I first tried to get a job at a hedge fund in the, in the Caribbean, actually, because uh, I had a job offer with Lehman Brothers in New York City. And this was right after 9-11. And everybody thought they were going to nuke New York City. They're going to nuke New York City. <laughs> so I was terrified to go live in New York City at the time. Uh, <laughs> So I, the Caribbean was a horrible experience. So I ended up then in Atlanta and I figured nobody really wants to blow up Atlanta. So I started trading stocks in the Atlanta Financial Center at a small prop trading firm, which is something I always tell people when they start asking me about trading is that if you have to pay someone to teach you how to trading, they probably don't know how to trade. So I had a company that put me up in corporate housing. They gave me an account to trade. They taught me how to trade their money. And I always tell people to try to find this kind of setup because if they're willing to put their money on the line, it means they've actually got something to teach you. But if you're paying them, then if they could trade, they'd be trading. They wouldn't be be out selling how to teaching how to trade courses. What was that lifestyle like? What is it like the, the the movie Wolf of Wall Street? Is it fast paced, high high stress levels, or like what kind of a person is suited for that kind of a job? Well, this is the Wolf of Wall Street is actually about brokers and actually about scam artist brokers, which I could tell you loads of stories about that from later on. But uh, when you're actually a trader, you're it's 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 high stress, but it's not like Wolf of Wall Street where everyone's screaming and shouting. I mean, there are days where people are kicking over chairs and getting really pissed off because they've lost a lot of money real fast. And some people are, you know, you go to the bar after work and half the room that lost money is kind of crying in their beers. And then the other half that had a really good day, you know, they're buying drinks because basically every day you wake up and you have a PL number at the end of the day. So you either went to work and made money or you went to work and lost money. And that's a difficult thing to deal with mentally because you could be like 30 days or 28 days into a month and be having one of the best months ever. And in literally like an hour, you could lose your whole month and you basically went to work for a month for free. And it happens like you have these occasional kicks in the gut that are, you're constantly always on guard to not take a big loss. You just take a lot of really small losses and try to let your winners run. It's basically scalping was the style we did, which is you're just kind of in and out all day long, just nickels and dimes and quarters over and over again. Not a very fun way to make a living when you're, when you're doing it in university, it seems like it's fun, but then after a couple of years of grinding it out, it kind of gets to be just tedious. Mm -hmm. So how did you move to Thailand? How, what was that transition from a uh, stock trader to Thailand? So, once I felt like I was a good enough stock trader to, to make a go of it, I, I had to switch firms because the firm uh, I worked for didn't want me going remote. So I found another firm and I tested trading from home on my own for about six months. And then I felt like, yes, I can do this. So I had a, a, I got the idea from a girlfriend of mine at the time in Atlanta whose brother's frat buddy was teaching English in Phuket. And she was planning out to go and visit him. And I started seeing Phuket all the time with the tsunami. You know, the stock trading room has these um, TV screens in all the, the corners that play the news all day long. And after the tsunami, you're just seeing pictures of Phuket over and over and over again. And I just really got the urge to move there. I don't know why, because maybe it reminded me I always wanted to go to Thailand. Uh, so I started looking into how could I legally do that and trade from there and get a visa and all of that. And she basically, I'd had a couple of friends that had taught English in places like Peru and Japan. So I knew this was something that was was possible. And basically he said, yeah, come on over. You could basically get a 20, 25 hour part time job and you'll get a visa and then you could trade stocks at night. And to me, that seemed perfect. So I went over. and Basically, that's what I did. I did a TEFL course, 
moved to Phuket, got a job teaching English. And I mean, I think there were different kinds of jobs back then. Some you had to be on a contract with a government school where you're there all day long. I did one via language school. So I only had to teach the hours I was actually at, at a property at one of the schools. So I think I got away with working like 13, 15 hours a week, got my visa paid for uh, and was trading at night. And then I actually stopped trading once I kind of got established uh, because from here, the New York Stock Exchange opens about 9.30 p.m. Yeah, you're working nights. I was I was also like 20-something, right? So I was in my 20s still. And that's when the bar scene really gets fired up. I moved to Nyharn in 2005. It was an amazing time to be in Nyharn in Rawai. Like, Nyharn was still like, like where all the big condos are. I lived on a little dirt road and bungalows. I could walk to Nyharn Beach. There was like a couple, like a Mexican restaurant, a reggae bar at, at the lake there. It was really still just rubber trees, really nature, nature-based, hippie kind of a little community there. There was already a really well-established expat community, but it was off the beaten tourist path. Whereas now, I don't know how much you know about Phuket, but Rawai is just as busy as Batong now. I mean, it is maybe even gets more tourists in Rawai than Batong now. I don't know the actual numbers, but it's a, it's just completely blown up over the last 10 years. Yeah, you know, I, I've always avoided Phuket, um just because I, it's just a massive tourist trap. Um, I do like it. I'm not going to say I don't like it. I do like it. I could go there for a couple of days, three or four days. But Ko Chang, people. Ko Chang is what you had back in 2005. I did an ultra marathon in Ko Chang, and it, it actually um, did remind me of what Rawai was like in, 95, in 2005. I mean, it had that same kind of just quiet, chilled out vibe. Although even then, I think the where, where I live now, though, like, People think of Phuket as like certain places. I mean, I live in a part of Phuket that has no tourists. It's like I live by this reservoir. There are thousands and thousands of rye of jungle mountain trails. I go to beach. I can go to the beaches within five, 10 minutes, but there's nobody around. So, I mean, there, there's still a lot of that left in Phuket. But when people come here on holiday, they all go to the same two or three or four beach towns. And they're like so overdone and touristy that people think that that's all that Phuket is, which in reality, I mean, there are parts of this island that are so desolate, you'd, you'd like, you'd rather go be in Isan because there's more happening. I mean, like, my cow beach is just a long stretch with nothing going on. It's it's basically completely undeveloped still. Uh, but it will come. It will it eventually will spread everywhere on this island, I think. So let's get back into your story about you. And so you were, part of your story, you told me you started a hedge fund and you managed a hedge fund over here. This is later. Well, it was it was based. Uh, I was involved with quite a few because I started out after after I lived here. I basically I decided I wanted to move into something a little bit less. Uh, what's called discretionary trading is where you're very, um, like you say, scalping. You're in and out all the time. It's kind of flying by the seat of your pants. And I kind of want. I knew I wanted to go back and do an MBA and kind of move into the more asset management, uh, quantitative side of that. And I initially thought I was going to do. A stint as an investment banker or something like that, which luckily I never never did because they work like hundred hour weeks and they're not free at all. It's like a they make a lot of money, but like for me, I've always been terrified of being stuck in some big city, chained to a desk all day long. <laughs> so I I did I actually met my ex wife got 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 married had a kid. I went and did my MBA in Europe, and then I initially came back to Thailand as a management consultant, uh, working in the plastics industry. So I, I lived in Bangkok. I was going out to Amanakana Khan in, in Chonburi, and I just had enough of that. And I said, I'm going to go into wealth management, basically dialing for dollars for a company based out of Malaysia. And then they had a sister firm that was an asset management firm. So then they pulled me in because of my trading experience to work on some of the hedge funds. Uh, it made me a partner in the asset management company that was based out of Singapore. So I was working for a, a basically a, a Malaysian-based wealth management company and a Singapore-based asset management company. And then we got involved with another hedge fund where we partnered with a, a UK-based asset management company. Basically, all of them didn't do really well, but they didn't do horrible. And yet in the hedge fund industry, if you like lose two or 3% a year for your first couple of years, you can't market the fund. Your track record is your, your basically you live and die by your track record. So those were really good learning experiences. And then I opened up my own fund out of the BVIs and basically, I kind of had the philosophy that I was going to put my money where my mouth was. Uh, and I, basically, the asset management company I started and the wealth management company that basically mentored me out here, uh, we all got wrapped up in this this fund in, in the UK that basically ended up scamming us out of loads and loads of money. And it was it was kind of a pretty sad horror story. 
my mentor basically threw away 20 years of hard work. A lot of his really best clients and people I cared about, we all kind of, we all lost various amounts of money with this, you know, and, and you come out to Asia, everyone's afraid of things in Asia, but you know, sure enough, it's like a, back in the UK, FCA regulated promotion, promote, promoted fund, you know, run by lawyers that are regulated in the UK. And, you know, they just, they know how to game the system. And I found out later on only if my brother actually was a prosecutor for the SEC in the US, that actually the biggest frauds all happen in the most highly regulated jurisdictions like the US, like the UK, like Australia. Because if you think like a scam artist, you want to just get rid of all the red flags as much as possible. So you go to the most highly regulated jurisdictions. They do all of the things to look like they're, they're run really well. And then they treat the investment funds like they're piggy banks. They steal money. And I don't know. I, to me, to this day, the guy that, that um, we ran into a lot of trouble with, who it's pretty well documented that he, he stole money from this fund, you know, like millions and millions of pounds. And he's still walking free to this day. Like, What is the story with you now? You're, you're running a school now in Phuket. Is that right? Yeah. So I, I also had, I mean, my kids, I was hoping this interview would be more about like my kids and the amazing life I've been able to give them. Cause oh, we can get a into lot that. Of we can, we do... can go down that road. Yeah. So this is uh, where I think we're kind of heading as well is cause like a lot of people I always see are like really worried about raising their kids in Thailand and what kind of an education do they get in Thailand and what do you actually need out of an education for a child coming into the, the new, basically the new economy we're going to have in the future. And I, I remember dealing with all these questions when my kids were little and I started them off in this little homeschool and basically they outgrew it. And I just kind of didn't want to send them into this rigid structure, these institutionalized, whether it's the international schools here, which are also exorbitantly expensive. Uh, but I, I, I volunteered in, in some of the nice ones and they, they had, you know, you deal more with worrying about your kid becoming this elitist snobby thinks he's better than everyone else kind of a kid. But then if you were to send him to a Thai government school, you worry about him just not getting critical thinking skills. So the idea to either do some form of homeschooling or alternative schooling is, is, is something that I think more and more people should look into because I, I, I met a lot of people who are grownups that grew up on boats. There's a lot of big yachty community here. And, and some of these people were saying when they were kids, they homeschooled for like two, two hours a day, three hours a day. And they're just as intelligent as anyone you'd meet now. And on top of that, they use the extra time to get like hands-on skills, fixing boats and motors and doing all of these things. Um, so I, I basically took over a small homeschool that they were leaving. And then we basically grew it and I put my kids through the whole system. And now my kids went from basically growing up on not iron beach. You know, I, I was still working doing wealth management and stuff. So, I mean, I would take them to the beach in the morning or drop them it was even before they would go to school. I would go to the playground with them, go to the parks, do a couple of emails and phone calls, chase them around the playground. Then when they were old enough to go to the homeschool, I would, I would drop them off, take them to, to breakfast every morning. And, and once I got involved in doing the school myself, I realized that like so much of the school day is fluff and is daycare. And what I've been able to do with my kids now is they basically graduated two years early. My oldest one is now working in a digital media company at 16 years old. Um, you know, and he's born and bred basically here in Thailand. And I mean, if I think the key formula for me as well is, is I notice a lot of the families here will mix up the language and all that. But if, if the father is a native English speaker and the mother's a native Thai speaker or vice versa, if both parents speak to the kids in their native language, they end up completely fluent and native in both, both languages. So like my kid can go down the skate park, meet a bunch of Thai friends and socialize and hang out with the Thais. He can also hang out with all, there's a lot of mixed kids, Luke Krung kids at our school. And they go down to the Friday boat Avenue market in Bang Tao area and it's, it's to me, I think Thailand is just the best place in the world to raise a kid. And I think if, if anybody's considering doing it, like I just would be so terrified of all the trouble my kids could get into back in my hometown. Like if, if you were to raise kids there now, there's this opiate, opioid academic. There was never any heroin or any of that stuff in my hometown. The kids I grew up with didn't leave now. They're dropping like flies. I mean, these are people with families. They're 40 year old, 42 years old, and they're, you know, kids are finding them dead from an overdose, stuff like that. Like you just don't see any of that in the community around me here. But what about the other the dangers of like um the nightlife and stuff like that? That could be quite hard for a 17, 18 year old to deal with. They could get caught up in in, you know, the, that kind of a vice. Yeah, you could, but I think I don't know if it's me because I was 
the, the, the straight edge scene was, there was a lot of fights and stabbings and stuff going on. And when you got in the hippie community as well, there was loads of drugs and all of this. And I was around all that stuff as well. And I think it teaches you to be street smart if you're exposed to it, but you have your parents and people that you can actually talk to. Like my kid, if he does go out to any of the nightlife areas, he always comes home and tells me what he did the, the, the night before and which one of his friends made an ass out of himself. And I never get angry. I keep the, the that that line of communication open with your kids. I think that's a big thing because there is trouble everywhere in the world. But I think here, you know, you have more of a, I, I think even though Thailand night, Thai nightlife seems so crazy, it's actually so much more relatively safe. Like you can just be as drunk as you want in most any of the nightlife areas in Thailand. And yeah, maybe you could get robbed by a lady boy or something. But I mean, for the most part, you're not really in physical danger. I think you mentioned this in one of the videos you, you, you made about going back to Dublin and like, walking down the street with your wife at night and going like, Oh, I suddenly in America, you feel that way all the time. You go out into any city, you know, you come out of the bars late at night and you just don't know what's going to happen. There's always stuff kicking off. Whereas out here, I just feel like there's not, there's not that same kind of danger. In it. And I think it's all of Asia. Like really is. Yeah. You're a hundred percent right. It's, it's uh, I don't know what it is. I'm, I'm trying to figure it out myself after being 12 years in Thailand, coming back to the West. I'm trying to figure out what is it about, you know, it must be something to do with Western culture. Um, it, is it to do with capitalism? I don't know what it is. Is it to do like in the West, we, we want more and more and more and more and more. It's literally dog eat dog. And that goes down into who we are as people. I don't know what it is. I'm trying to figure it out. Like, you know, like you said, there are places in Dublin and I, and I when I first got over here, I wasn't open to the fact, um, like I was in Thailand, it's so safe in Thailand. Like you say, the, the nightlife areas and stuff like that, you don't really see, okay, occasionally you see a, a couple of fights and when there is a fight, it can be bad, but that's nothing compared to what happens on the streets of Dublin on a Saturday night, you know? I think it, it, Syracuse is probably similar to Dublin is that you don't necessarily have to go looking for it there, right? I think the guys who tend to get in those fights here, because Thais will generally avoid confrontation until the very last moment. Uh, and then when they explode... They just go all out, right? So, I mean, it goes from smiling to they're pulling out a machete and chasing down the road. Whereas, you know, I think in the West, it's more like, oh, we'll have a quick punch up and forget about it. And ties don't have that mentality, right? They, they'll they smile and why and laugh and laugh. But if you're the kind of angry drunk that comes out here, that's the type I think that find themselves in trouble. Because if, if you eventually back a tie into a corner, like – and you're not going to win because you, 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 this is their country and they'll fight you 10 on one. And, but you really have to go looking for it to get in trouble here. Whereas I think back home, the trouble kind of finds you. So you've got to be more on your edge and be wary, especially like, you know, I spent some time in the Caribbean and Guatemala and there is even worse. I mean, you're just constantly walking around. Like everybody's armed to the teeth everywhere. And you just don't, you know, it's just not a nice feeling. You come out here. I just, I, since I've moved out here, you just, your guard goes completely down. You just, and I've never had any real issues the whole time I've been here. Let's go back to your school for a second. So, like, what is different about your curriculum? Have you developed some sort of new uh, curriculum, something that's different than the regular schools or what? What we try to do is develop digital nomads. So, like, the idea is that we can't stray too far from what's traditional schooling or people will be kind of afraid, you know, by the whole idea that it's too. So we use, like, the number one international curriculum in the world for your math, your science, your English. Uh, so we make sure everybody's staying on the, the, the normal path they do uh, with your core subjects. But then, you know, we obviously, we also do a lot of the other stuff like art and we do Chinese, Thai, Thai grammar, social studies, all that kind of stuff. But then we always supplement it with, with different life skills. So I'll teach stuff about, we have like chess club, trading clubs. I do anything from philosophy to psychology, to statistics, finance, accounting, like we call these life lessons. And we just try to give the stuff that you, you need in the new world that you maybe aren't going to necessarily be taught in school. And also I try to give a lot of just kind of glimpses into different areas of study that you don't normally start until your university, which is only because the, the modern education system was designed to keep people in one place to socialize you to sit at a cubicle or sit at a factory station for all these long hours on end, sit down, shut up, do your part, Whereas the modern workforce is people meeting in small groups, going to breakout rooms, doing Zoom calls. So like we try to have them working in small groups on things, getting them used to doing online projects. So like my, my son and his best friend, they're kind of spearheading the older group where they were doing like a professional level, like IBM certifications and like SQL and Python. 
some of these coding skills that are going to be very high in demand and basically getting them introduced as well to the, the different types of, of stuff you can do where you can earn money and be a digital nomad is I, I really think if, if, if you set these kids up to have those kind of options, they can still go to a brick and mortar business and, and basically go to work uh, in a big company or whatever, but they also have the option of living somewhere like Phuket and earning a Western money and doing what, you know, Tim Ferriss called the geographic arbitrage many years ago, which was something I thought, Hey, that's what I'm doing right now. Actually, I'm earning Western money living in Thailand back in 2005. And, you know, now more and more people are switched onto it. There's this growing digital nomad scene. I think the opportunities for people to network and grow careers where you can bounce around places like Bali is blowing up Chiang Mai uh, down in Hawaii. You're starting to get a lot of them out here. And it's, a lot of it's the old hippie trail and the digital nomads don't like it when I call them the, no, the new backpackers, but they're basically doing what people used to do 10, 20 years ago. They're young. They're in the twenties. They want to go out and they see the world. You, you can be some sort of a YouTuber or content creator and you don't need to earn a ton of money to bounce around from places like Sri Lanka and, and Changu and all these places. And it, I think it's not a derogatory thing calling these kids new backpackers. I, I'm, I'm saying like they have an amazing opportunity and I think everybody should experience that for a year or two in your life to just be traveling around, earning money online, seeing different cultures, eating different foods, checking out different places, uh, and eventually then finding somewhere you love and settling down and just staying there. What about the cost of living? Um, say, I always compare, Phuket for me always seems about 20, 30% more than other parts of Thailand. I'd say it's not too much more expensive than Bangkok, but uh, just living there long-term as an expat, is it an expensive place to live? It can be super expensive or super cheap. Like I, I used, I had a house in Isan and I used to go up and spend two, three months in Isan. And I would say when I was living in Isan, now keep in mind, I had the house there and I bounced around here. I've always, chose, I have land here, but I haven't built because I don't want to be stuck there. It's still too undeveloped. It's actually so quiet where my land is that I don't want to move there yet. And, and I've moved around to like 10 different houses. I always find a three bedroom house for somewhere between 10 and 15,000 baht a month. And that you find people coming here and renting places for like 100, 200,000 about a month. So, and, and a lot of it is just like, if you want to be smack in the middle of a tourist area and a little tourist street where everybody speaks English, or you want to be 10 minutes away in a Thai neighborhood where everyone speaks Thai. And to me, the restaurants are better anyways in the Thai. So I eat probably 75% Thai food, 25% Farang food. And, th and that makes a big swing, especially because I've got five teenagers living in my house. Uh, so we're, feeding in seven people at a time. So the difference I would say in the main thing is that if you eat a lot of really expensive Western, Western restaurants and the expensive restaurants, you can burn through a lot of money here. There's a lot of high end stuff. Uh, but I mean, most of the Island are Thai and Burmese people that live on 10 to 20,000 baht a month. Right. So if they can all live on that in Phuket, then, you know, you're obviously not going to live in a shack like a Burmese lives in, but you can get reasonable rents here if you're in the right neighborhoods and, you can also get reasonable rents in the neighborhoods that you wouldn't think so by just going around and looking at like signs for rent in Thai language. And again, I know a lot of people can't do that, but most people come here, they get an agent and you're going to pay five times the price for a rental. If you get an agent, as opposed to going around looking at, at signs written in Thai for rentals. And that's something I, I guess while we're on that subject, I think everybody should learn Thai, learn to read and write Thai. If you're going to live here long-term, it, it just creates a completely different experience for you if you do it. Like you, you'll, you'll understand different aspects of Thai society that you never get without the language and without being yeah. able to read. How the right integrated the are you in the culture? You know, learning Thai, speaking Thai, and knowing the customs, and being able to, you know, work the, I suppose, the the Thai magic. Yeah, I mean, I I learned to read and write almost twenty years ago, so I I've been doing it for a long time, and I worked in, in, in schools and I own my school. I work with a lot of Thai families and I spent a lot of time in Isan, learned a little bit of Lao, although me and my ex-missus split a while ago. So I haven't really uh, gone back up there or practiced. Uh, my new missus is from the South now. So actually trying to pick up the Southern dialect, but that, that's probably the hardest one to learn. Uh, it's really sing-songy, birdie. It's, it's a funny sounding. Yeah, the Southern dialect always kind of made me laugh. Like it's always sounded way different than the other dialects. It does. It's, and it, it's, even I, I can understand it, but like to make myself make those sounds now feels as funny as it originally felt making the Thai sounds 20 years ago. You know, like when you first have to make the tones right and all of that, 
you just feel a bit funny. It doesn't feel right. I mean, I, I would go to, um, I would go to a Thai teacher during the day, practice sounds with them. And then I would have to go out to the bar and get a couple of beers in me to get the beer muscles to actually even make the sounds, you know, and one or two beers. And then all of a sudden, uh, you're more it's just it's a relaxing thing it's it's all in your head like you can make the sounds you could you could have made them without the alcohol but you just needed those one or two beers and now you have a little bit of like dutch courage you know and then it, then it comes out it's crazy and then after a while you don't need it anymore i mean i got to the point where i was giving speeches on stage in thai i i, I actually got sucked into with some of my thai friends from my mba i got sucked into doing network marketing for a little while i i wanted to try like i've always been into sales right so like um and, and yeah, I mean, I had a big team of Thai network marketers who I was working with and, you know, we're communicating online in Thai, written Thai, and I'm giving like sales pep talks, to like 30 Thai people in Thai. And it was a great experience for the language. You learn a lot of professional Thai, the words that you don't normally use in everyday language. Uh, and I think that was a really great experience, even though like uh, two years of wasted time and embarrassing yourself. It's a horrible industry, if you ask me. But yeah, yeah, that's what I was going to say. MLM in in Europe, we call it network marketing. Is it just a Ponzi scheme? Or like, what's the story? People at the top seem to make all the money, right? It's a to me, it's it's a bunch of small Ponzi schemes that build up and fizzle out. So it's like a they build a a, a big organization of small Ponzi schemes that are not. They they use all these clever ways to get around the laws and not be a Ponzi scheme. But like. I got into it because I'm really into fitness, doing ultra marathons, Ironman, surfing, and supplements. And I was like, man, I was so fed up with 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 scumbag money managers ripping off people you care about. And I was just like, I wanted to try something else. So I went into it like really full throttle ahead. I'm like, if I can make make a living related to the fitness industry and and you know helping spread supplements and all of this, but then what you find out is nobody's really interested in the supplements. They only care about making money. It's it's just a network of everybody trying to make money and nobody really giving a crap about the project products. And I do think that, yeah, I mean, if they're not in the business, everybody stops taking the products right away. So if in theory, it could not be a Ponzi scheme. If it was stuff that everybody did just recommend to their friends and you got a small commission off of having recommended it to your friend and it was products that people were going to use anyways. But I think what they do is they, 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 they come up with schemes to basically funnel all the money to the top and you get a couple of really rich people driving Lamborghinis and everybody wants that. So nobody wants the supplements. They want to be the guy driving Lamborghini. And and, and the, I think the industry preys on that mindset that we all have that of like, you know. There's you a lot of it in Thailand be, though, isn't there? There's a lot of Westerners doing it. I've come across it numerous times. Um, it seems to be like uh, people go over there and then they sell that dream of like, look, look, I'm in Thailand. I'm living on the beach. You want this lifestyle? Okay. Like, you can do it too. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, that all kind of came after I got out of it because like the whole YouTube influencer thing was just kind of revving up as I was getting out of that. And then it kind of kicked it like the ability now of everybody to try and be an influencer and buy a video camera and go to the beach and, you know, take pictures and video yourself doing yoga and jumping off cliffs. I mean, it's so cliche. Everybody does it. Uh, and you just I mean, it's cringeworthy here. You go to the beaches and you just see everybody's doing their homemade photo shoots. Yeah. And it's just. Um, I don't know if anybody buys into the bullshit anymore, but I think there must be people still like they say there's new sucker born every every minute. Right. So I guess it seems to work. People, people just um, I mean, look, like even if you look at my channel now, um, when I was on in Thailand and I was interviewing in, Th in Thailand, like it was a lot. It had a lot more, I think, um, impact on people like, oh, he's over in Thailand now. He's oh look, he's interviewing this person beside the beach. And. It's there. I think in the West, I mean, we when we look outside and it's a gray sky, and then we we always want more, isn't it? People want to have the better thing. And look at this person; they're over there in that country. Look what what are they doing? And it just plugs into people's minds, and that's why we have influencers. That's why we have all of that. And Thailand just seems to be a place that it's easy to do it because it's got beautiful beaches and you know it's cheap. People can do it over there. The trick you see a lot of people, I think, is is they don't think about how to earn money internationally while living here. So you get a lot of scamsters, tricksters. Uh, and in the old days, what used to give us a lot of people, they would go and they'd, they'd maybe work, uh, say, a summer season on the festivals, working on food carts in the UK or America, save up a bundle of cash, come live here for six months over the winter, and then they'd rinse and repeat and do that again. Uh, you know, and, and now I think you're getting more and more people. And I think a lot of it does have to do with the internet and YouTube and seeing all of this, that people that just come out here with no idea of how they're going to live out here, how they're going to survive. 
and and then they just try this hustle, that hustle, the next hustle. And you know, some guy came up to me on the beach just yesterday, actually. Some some fast talking London boy. He'd lived here for a long time, you could tell. And uh I don't know what he was on, but he was he was high as a kite on something. And he came down and just sat down next to me and, and started chatting shit. And I knew right away what was up. I don't know what he wanted to by the end, but I, I kind of I was like, Yeah, no, man, I've been here twenty years. Blah, blah, blah. And he, he kind of got up and wandered off. And I saw him sitting down next to some tourists. No idea what kind of scam he was trying to run. But like, I could just tell right away that this guy was sitting down to me for no good reason. Right. So I was... he didn't try the lost passport scam. Oh, I lost my passport. I remember that happened to me before. Some guy came up to me. He was like, I lost my passport. Like, I can't get out of here. I'm stuck here. Anything you can do. And I was like, Oh man, here's like a couple of hundred baht. Like, hope you get yourself sorted. Next day, I see him again doing the same thing. I'm like, what an asshole! The beggars come, the beg packers come through, and and like, luckily Thailand's pretty good about arresting them and kicking them out because it's it's. I mean, you got so much poverty here, you know, to come out here, a spoiled little rich Western kid and beg for money on the streets of a really poor country, it just makes all of us look bad, you know, like mm-hmm. all of them. But I mean, I can understand wanting to stay here, but like. It amazes me how, like, especially lately, they've been doing this uh, uh, crackdown on overstays in Phuket. And every couple of days in the newspaper, these guys are like 12-year overstays, five-year overstays. Thailand makes it so easy. They give you so many options to legally stay here from just signing up to Thai lessons. Again, they'll give you a visa. You know what I mean? It's, if you can't even do that, then you need to just go home and get your shit together, save up some money, get a job, get a career, get something going, and then come back out here. But can you imagine uh, watching your back, being on an overstay of five years and, and watching your back all the time and just not ha- no. having that? And it, That's not a way to live. Most no, of the guys not, just no. stay at home. They just stay at home. All, that's all they do. They're just scared to go outside. Yeah, I just don't understand why. Yeah, I don't know if it's like it starts like the, oh, maybe they go to renew it one time. It gets messed up and they're like trying to figure out what to do. A couple of weeks go by and then maybe a couple of months go by. I don't know. But uh for me, it's the kind of thing that if it's a day or two away and you haven't got to sort it out, you're hopping on a plane and you're getting it. I mean, I've always been on marriage visas. I've always done it myself. And now I, I got custody of my kids. I do custody visas. Uh, so it's, it's pretty easy for me because I just have to show money or whatever and they, they extend it. But I think even for everybody, it's not that difficult to be legal here. You have a myriad of options that are all relatively inexpensive. Yeah, you know, whenever whenever anyone ever complained to me about the visa or said like, oh, what visa do I need or have problem with this and problem with that, I always say, like the thing about Thailand compared to say Ireland or anything like that is there, it's hard to explain to to people that never been there because I'm trying to explain this to my dad and he's he's been there on holidays but he doesn't really get it some some of the time. I better be careful because he's watching. But anyway, just like it, basically, it's like in Thailand. No doesn't mean no. It means that there could be another way. And that's how, like, that's for everything across the country. Like, there there could be another way. It's flexible. Everything is flexible. Whereas in, in the West, it's like, you can do it or you can't. Yeah, that's something I don't think I could go back to the West after. Because for me, it, it's, you. I've always been able to manage to get everything done, right? But it's never the way you think it's going to be. And, and I've, I've, I've gone off on using agents for the most part. I mean, we have some with the school we use who are really good, but like, if you can never do anything yourself here, go straight to the government office that you need, ask them to help you to, t- and always just ask humbly for information. And then they always find an exception for you. They're like, well, you could do this or you could do that. And, and I've always made everything works. And this is like, you're, you're running around, you know, trying to get school stuff sorted and buildings need to have their building permit changed to be for education and all of these things. And, you know, you like, I see a lot of Ferran go in and act like they know the law and they're screaming and shouting and getting flustered and then you never get anything done here. But if you just go in and ask for help, you can always make – Thai people are very pragmatic like that. They'll always figure out a way to make it work. Uh, yeah. Very rare. That's my key. I never got angry when I was sorting out my visa or I was in, at immigration or uh, at the labor department getting the work permit. You know, it's just you stay quiet. That's the way it is. You talk, you speak when you're kind of spoken to, you know, when to why, you know, when to talk, when to not talk. The last thing you want to do is like big brash, like here I am, where's my yeah. visa? Like, where's my stuff? And you don't want it now. Come on. Like, it doesn't work that way. You're going to get in no, trouble. But you, you get that here a lot. And I remember when I first moved here, somebody called it the Thailand disease. Hold on a second. Guys. Let me, I should have put what, that on what's the Thailand disease? I'm interested. Uh, it's just the inflated ego foreigner. That comes over with a little bit of cash 
And they're the the thing with those kind of guys you see in immigration is they're used to dealing with Thai agents that where they can scream and shout at him and the Thai agent just smiles. They don't care because they're taking their money. Right. And then they go in the bars and they deal with the bar owners and the girls who will t- let them do whatever they want because they're flashing out the money. Uh, and then they go into a government office and they try and act the same way. And the government office is like, no, this doesn't work in here like this. And, and it is a thing uh, that Thai hospitality. It's so good that it actually ruins it for a lot of people because they come over, especially if you, you were in an industry like something like construction where you got to be a hard ass and a driver to get things done. And, you know, you, you just you don't talk to Thai people the same way and expect things to happen unless you're in these certain instances, like the people who come here and they live in these little bar bubble areas, right. Where they're in the bars all the time. And, and, and they, they're, you know, they then take this really, this, this nasty attitude with them when they go out into the rest of Thai society. And yeah, it's a warped view on, of Thailand. They don't see the real Thailand. They're, they're in that weird bubble of like, the, you know, like you said, bar bubble and, and uh, tourist bubble. Whereas they never, and then they always have this warped opinion of like what who type people are, and you're just like listening to them going, "This is not right. You're not. You're. You're. you're yeah. You're, no. It's just wrong. Like you're wrong. But th- I don't hang around with those people. I never did. I didn't. I never gave them any time. I just could not be listening to people complaining about Thailand and stuff. If you didn't, if you don't like it, just leave. Simple. Yeah. The great thing is those people tell you who they are by the end of the first conversation with them usually, right? Like you're out, you're out having drinks with some mates or whatever. They sit down with you. Within the first hour, they've probably slagged off Thailand, Thai people, this, that, and you kind of know. They, they generally yeah. show their true colors right away. And then you're just like, yeah, all right, I'm, I'm, next time you guys go out for drinks with this guy, I'm probably not going to go, right? And the thing that is, is, I think, nice about Thailand as well, though, is you tend to find out who all like the really kind of racist and obnoxious people are pretty quickly here. And then, you know, you just learn to distance yourself from them. Whereas in America, like, you, you, you can be around racists for a long time and not realize it. And then all of a sudden, it's like, they start saying some obnoxious things around a, a colored people or whatever. And you're just like, dude, what are you doing? Like, <laughs> don't talk, don't, don't rope me into your bullshit, man. Like, and, and now here again, I think, yeah, th- there's something about Thailand. I think it opens people up as well. So like people are more open here. So you, you generally, I think it brings the good and the bad and you, you, you could sort out who the people are pretty quickly. So like, I always say Phuket, you get the dregs of society from the West, but then you also get all the geniuses, all the amazing people, and like, I, you know, I, you do, if you do a lot of charity work and stuff as well, like we, we raise a lot of money for like the Burmese here and all the groups of people that we get and we do like big bike rides together and stuff like this. Uh, and, and then you, you end up meeting like really nice people that care and that are, you know, people that are often really wealthy and retired or, or have some sort of a business online, but they're still going out of their way to go and help the local community and, and, and don't you know, dedicate their time towards raising funds for kids that like, they can't even go to government schools here. You know, that's how bad the Burmese have it, right? They, they're living yeah. in like, like shanty town construction sites. Uh, and, you know, you're trying to raise money just to get them like a basic Burmese language education, reading and writing grammar and stuff like that. And to me like that, that's something like you, you get to work alongside like really great people when you do stuff like that. And then you go out to the bars and there's still great people in the bars here. I think a lot of people slag off Thailand bars that it's like full of only sex pats and all of that. Whereas like, no, I, I, yeah, I see those characters are all out here as well, but there's so many great sophisticated, professional, intelligent people I run into in bars and have conversations with and make friends with. And, um, you know, that's the same way I run with this uh, hash house Harriers trail running group here as well. And like, you just meet amazing people that have been here 20, 30 years running businesses, raising families, uh, you know, integrated into Thai society and, and just having a normal, great life here. And, those kind of stories are not as, as exciting as like, oh, my yeah, mate exactly. over here, his bar girl wife stole his, his money, stole his house, gambled away all his money, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Those make for great stories. But it's like, even me, I split up with my ex-missus. We, she didn't steal any money from me. We didn't have any issues. It was like we went to the emperor. We made an agreement together. We split his mutual friends. and David, any advice for anyone who wants to come over to Thailand and, and kind of do it? your way or do it uh, you, you sound like you've been successful you sound like you're happy any advice for people that would kind of want to seek the same thing yeah i would say one is just do it really because i think a lot of people spend their whole life dreaming and trying stuff and they're afraid it ain't going to work so they don't do it and like i moved to the caribbean and it was a disaster i moved back to the states licked my wounds got up did it again moved to thailand worried that the same thing was going to happen twice i wouldn't go into all the disasters that happened in the caribbean but it was horrible so when I came out here, I was really terrified that this was going to be just like the Caribbean. But I just had that in me, that travelers, I, I got to go find out for myself. 
And I think there's two ways you could do it if you wanted to come out here and make it work. I think in the old days, most people used to come out as an English teacher to get your feet wet, get a visa, do some good for the community. I mean, it's, it's not hard work if you're in a government school with second and third graders going banana, 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 apple, apple, teaching them basic sentences. I go to the movies, you know, like, and you can live here and get your feet on the ground, start to network. Then you can slide into brick and mortar businesses or like I came out as a digital nomad. You could also spend a bit of time, develop an online income stream of some form. And as soon as it's big enough to cover a very small amount of money, you can probably sort out your education visa, come here, spend six months or 12 months. And I think what most people do, they end up not leaving. Uh, Thailand, at least Phuket, like a lot of my old, my, my business partner is, is, is from the UK. So it's a lot closer. A lot more of his friends would come visit than my friends. Barely, very few people come from America because it's so far. But so many of his friends, they'd come out on a holiday one year. They'd come out on holiday the next year. By the third year, they decided to make it stick somehow. And and they would just do any kind of a random legal job, get a work permit. But like they almost all would come out, teach English for a year. And now, you know, 10 years later, they're all still here. Like they just stay. And I think for me, though, the the having a discipline, getting in groups of communities that are positive as well, like, uh, and it depends on what age you're at. Like if you're in your twenties, yeah, you're going to be doing more of the nightlife stuff. But if you move into your thirties and your forties, it becomes more about your career or your fitness and your family. You know, I always try to balance out all those aspects. And I think, yeah, I honestly think you could come out here and do just about anything, be successful. I know people that have come out here and opened up restaurants and made tons of money, uh, open up like logistics companies, make tons of money, get into hotels. There's this misconception that Thailand is a place you come to bring money and you lose it all here. Whereas I came in my twenties and I know tons of people that came here at a young age and they built lives for them here. They built businesses uh, and you build them from scratch the same as you would back home, trial and error, fall on your face. You get back up, you try it again. Something doesn't work. You maybe, you know, I know people that they've had to go home for two, three years, come back, you know, to make it work again. But you know, they stay out for five, 10 years, fall on their face, go back home, work a couple of years, come back. Um, that's it. Come back, learn new skills. Like uh, life, life is ups and downs. It's not always up. So you got to just, it's all about having that positive mindset. But David, we're going to leave it there. Um, I'd okay. love to have you on again. Uh, I really enjoyed the chat and I, I like the, like, I like the positive kind of uh, your angle that you take on life. And I, you're definitely someone that I could have a beer with and, and just talk with, with off the camera yeah, as definitely. well, you know? Um, yeah, if you're ever in Phuket or back in Thailand. Oh yeah, I'll be there for sure. Up, for man. sure. I'll be there probably I'll be in Thailand in in the summer anyway, next summer, June, July, August, sometime then. But um yeah, yeah so yeah, come down, bring the wife down, come do a trail hike with us at the hash, meet some of the guys. Uh, and I'll definitely I'll, I can I'll give you a list of like five, ten people with short bios on them as well. Cause I, I there's some really interesting people I know down here that would be cool to be on your show as well. Like yeah, if you got to, yeah, I'm I'm always looking for interesting people. That would that would be great help. Yeah, for sure. I'd love to hear their stories and get them on the channel for everyone else to enjoy as well. So anyway, David, we're gonna I'll leave it there and uh, I'll I'll talk to you online. I got your line, so I'll send a couple of messages and uh, I'll chat to you there. But uh thanks very much cool. and all the best. No, thank you. I enjoyed it as well. Thanks you too. Take care, David. Have a good one. Yeah, you too. Cheers. Bye. See you soon. Bye. See you.